Hello, everybody. I'm Jessica Davis, Marketing and Communications Manager for Fear Free. Thank you for joining us for How Fear Free and Best Practices Go Hand in Hand in Shelters, sponsored by Myrox. In this webinar, Dr. Sarah Pisano, Fear Free Certified Professional and Animal Welfare Strategist, will discuss how a fear free experience in the shelter must be top priority and can only be achieved when the shelter is operating efficiently and all resources used strategically. If you have any questions during the webinar, please be sure to enter them in the Q&A box. We will have a brief Q&A session at the end of the presentation. We're very excited to have Dr. Pisano speak with us today. So on that note, Dr. Pisano, take it away. Thank you so much, Jessica, I appreciate it. And thank you for everybody for attending. I am so grateful for Fear Free. I, I speak all over the country. I'm a frequent public speaker. And I have to tell you, this is, I, I'm 10 out of 10 excited to do this webinar. Fear Free is my dream come true. And I'm so appreciative that Fear Free contributed to the playbook, which I'll tell everybody about. So happy to have you all listening. And here are my qualifications. So first of all, I was born Fear Free. And for those of you in my tribe, you know exactly what I'm talking about. We are people who are very sensitive to how animals are feeling and how their behaviors are reflected of those feelings and what they're experiencing. So I've always been very in tune to animals and I didn't really understand that until I started working at the Animal Medical Center as a clinic assistant in 1987. And the vets would say, there's an aggressive German shepherd and they would walk by all the guys that were six feet and over and say, where's Pisano? Because we know that, that Pisano can, knows how to handle these animals in a gentle way and calm them down. So this is for all you people who were born fear free and for us to help others be as sensitive to what animals are, are going through. And of course, I'm a fear free certified professional and encouraging everyone to get Fear Free certified, whether you're working in a shelter, as staff, you're a volunteer, you're a board, you're an elected official, please get Fear Free certified. It's so incredibly important. So now um, I'm gonna talk about best practices and the framework from which this is being presented to you. And it comes from more than 30 years experience in animal welfare, I've been a shelter veterinarian and high volume surgeon. I worked in large private shelters and I myself was the director of public, a public shelter as well. So whoever you are listening, I promise I understand intricately what your challenges are. And this um, webinar presentation ideas, this is really for a broad, broad audience. So in 2013, I began doing shelter and community assessments. I've done over a hundred now. So Team Shelter USA is my consulting firm. And I also am over the pro bono program with the University of Florida. 17 states, I worked in shelters. And mind you, a lot of the shelters, most of the shelters that I work with are euthanizing most of the animals or were euthanizing most of the animals. But what I've also found is those shelters that are over 90%, holy cow, there's an enormous amount of waste and ways that we can release our fears of a negative consequence and make sure we achieve our goals. And here's what I can promise you. In every one of those hundred shelters, every single shelter said to us, we're different. You don't understand, we're unique here. And so I have this global view, I can promise you, rural, urban, high poverty rate, low poverty rate, we are all facing the same challenges from A to Z. And here's the amazing news, the solutions are universal as well. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. So I put all of these ideas and best practices that you know, are um, considered the norm today. And I wrote the best practice playbook. And again, very broad audience, 
This is for shelter staff and directors, municipal leaders, funders, volunteers, rescues. And as you probably know by now, there are fear free tips throughout the playbook. And it's available now on Amazon. But five lucky listeners today are going to win the playbook. So stay tuned and you'll get a notice at the end of this webinar or in the near future that um, you won the playbook. So we're excited to offer that to you. But if you don't believe me and believe what's in the playbook, which is actually a reflection of what um, these best practices are, um, you can go on any of the National Animal Welfare Organization websites and learn about them. The playbook was just a place to put them all in one place and make it super easy friendly. So here's the number one fear-free tip keep animals out of the shelter. And it sounds like something silly to say, but I find that we have for so long focused on the adoption, the rescue, the transport, and we paid no mind to animals flooding into the shelter. And we know now that we have this amazing potential. So number one, we work so desperately to keep animals happy and healthy when they enter shelters and have a fear-free environment. But holy cow, the shelter, no shelter is a home. So number one, we need to concentrate on keeping them out of the shelter. And this is truly what our, it's not just saving shelter animals that is our goal. That's really when you think about it, our secondary goal. Our first goal is for animals to live like my pets. This is a bed that is extremely large in the middle of our kitchen. And that is because our dog and cat don't want to be far from us, right? So we want animals to live like this and not actually ever enter the shelter. So please, again, no matter who you work with or don't work with, remember that we all have this common goal and we serve these animals in need best when we collaborate together. We need to look at all of our resources very strategically. And this is something that I think is a major problem in animal welfare. We've positioned ourselves as victims and we think from this scarcity mindset, we don't have enough money, we don't have enough shelter space, we need more staff, we need more this, that, and the other thing. And what I'm asking you to think about is think about what you do have and think about how you can use it more strategically because it's shocking to find this enormous amount of waste inherent in the animal control and sheltering system. We also don't want, we don't want to limit ourselves to think, well, it's just about money. I promise you money is number two. Strategic design of programs is number one and the way we think about this system. So resources in addition to money, shelter space, right? What kinds of spaces we have available for animals? What will allow us to provide humane housing, double compartment housing, outside play arts, et cetera? What is our staff doing? What are our volunteers doing in the shelter? What are they raising money for? All of those things. And are we truly capitalizing on every possible partnership? And that doesn't mean just animal welfare people or organizations. Are we going to the Buick dealer and trying to get those guys involved in our mission? Because if we're not, then we still have potential in our communities to get everybody involved. So I really want to inspire you to think about what you do have, because the stories I'm going to tell you first of all, have, are shocking to me. And in my work, in particular since 2013, I am incredibly humbled by the stories that I'm going to tell you because I, I never expected success to be so much easier than it actually is. And we just haven't been thinking about animal sheltering with the right perspective. So let's think about what we do have, and that helps us work smarter, not harder. Before I do assessments, a lot of people say, listen, we can, we're not gonna have you come do an assessment because we just don't have time. We're working 
so hard. We can't fit another thing in our day. And I totally get it because I was there. But this is about using your time in a smarter way. Productively decreasing intake means I'm going to help animals a different way than the traditional shelter intake. I'm going to look at how I'm using all my resources to make sure I'm eliminating wasteful practices. And boy, this is the number one problem I'm seeing is that there's a lot of programs, practices, ordinances leading away from our goals. So we need to make sure we're using everything strategically. If animals do enter the shelter, it is fear-free, it is the best possible care and enrichment. It is the shortest length of stay. And what happens organically, I'm only left with true euthanasia because I saved everyone else. True euthanasia means dangerous dogs that are too unsafe to rehabilitate. That is a very small percentage. And then medical cases beyond anybody's resources or help. And so traditionally, we, we call that, oh, 90% or better. Some people choose to use the words no kill. But in any event, it means I am not euthanizing for space. I'm only euthanizing those two very small categories of animals in those conditions. But first, what I want you to think about is your own microcosm. So our human brain is, ex we are exposed to different things throughout our lives, from our childhood, through our schools, through our parents, through our experiences and our jobs. We have experiences that are unique to us. And I call that, that's our microcosm. So we have to remember when we're thinking about looking at things differently, is this my microcosm or is this really the true global picture? And that's why I tell you about my experience with over a hundred shelters. I know that a lot of you listening on your Facebook feeds, it is filled with animals who are abused, neglected, abandoned. It's bad. It's reflections of people not caring about animals. And I understand that is your microcosm. But we have to remember that that is not the global picture of certainly people in our country. We are a country of animal lovers. And we have to respect that about ourselves, but also about the people that we're trying to work with. They also have their unique experiences. And when we're sensitive to that and understand why they have their fears that might be different than mine, this is when we can open up communication and collaborate more effectively. And this is a major issue in animal welfare. In every community I visit, there is bad blood between animal welfare organizations, and that's heartbreaking. That's because when we work together, the animals win, and when we don't, the animals lose. So Waco, Texas, I use as my poster child. Not only was this my first assessment in 2013 when I was with Target Zero, but Waco, Texas is an important story because it has a 30% poverty rate. This chart depicts the trends that I'm talking about. The whole bar all the way on the left is total intake. The green is the animal, the number of animals that made it out alive, and the blue is euthanasia. So you can see every year, same results, right? Intake increase, or I'm sorry, in, live outcome increased a little bit, but it wasn't until we went in 1213, there was a drastic decrease in not only shelter intake, but you can see euthanasia as a reflection of that. And look at the live outcome number. It only went up a little bit, but you can see how that 90% means something different when it's so much easier to get to, when we don't have animals flooding into the shelter. My point is this is the trend 
that we are seeing when shelters and communities implement these best practices, you have a drastic decrease in intake and therefore youth in Asia. Now Waco, Texas is, you know, back then they were 36%-ish um, live outcome. They've been over 90% now several years. Um, but when I was shelter director, I, I have to tell you, if we increased live outcome by 2%, that was a major celebration. Um, and we really had no hope 20 years ago, 15 years ago about decreasing intake to this um, extent. So really, really exciting. So assessment after assessment, we're seeing these giant numbers. In Greenville, South Carolina, the very first year, 3,500 less youth in Asia's, El Paso, Texas, that many decreased euthanasias. Anderson County, South Carolina, and Montgomery County, Ohio, never were over 50% live outcome. When they just listened to using best practices and changing these strategies, both of those communities within three months exceeded a 90% live outcome. And in fact, the director, Dr. Kim Sanders at Anderson County was with us in Montgomery County years later. We were there November 2018 in Montgomery County and actually told her testimony and said, I get it. Your community is where our community was. And I promise you, you can do it. I get chills even telling you this story. And now Montgomery County, Ohio is a much different conversation now. So I looked at just 18 of those shelters because I'm thinking out of those hundred that I've done, we've done those assessments on so far because I thought, well, that's, kind of, that's a lot of animals that I didn't expect. And I can promise you that this number greatly humbled me. Just 18 of those shelters, almost 50,000 less euthanasias. And that was only part of the story. This created more time for more space in the shelter, more time for the staff. I have so many staff continue. We continue to get messages from staff just got one yesterday. My colleague Cameron Moore got one yesterday that said, when you came to our shelter, it was a game changer. I was going to quit my job. I was so burnt out. So this is not just about animals. This is about our compassion fatigue as well. And it's not just about euthanasia. It's about keeping animals out of shelters and it's about not wasting our precious resources. And we start by building the best foundation. And so I want you to think about what we've for so long been suffering with inside the shelter walls. It's all downstream issues, if you will. Let's just take kennel cough, upper respiratory infection. That's because we have too many animals coming into the shelter. We have not, for the most part, especially with cats, housed them humanely and they had way too long lengths of stay, those are symptomatic issues. But what if I was able to keep a lot of those animals out of the shelter and if they did come in, get them out quickly? That's what I'm talking about when I say upstream. We need to create the best foundation and the system of animal control and sheltering in our, in our country was deeply flawed. And I'm so happy to know there's so many shelters now doing it right. Um, but again, great opportunity. Last year, Best Friends reported 733,000 animals were euthanized in shelters, dogs and cats. Um, and that's a major improvement, but we're not done yet. Responsible public policy is the framework. This is where we start whether you're a public or private shelter, I don't care who you are, maybe you're not with an organization, you should be advocating for responsible public policy because we're all taxpayers. And I know I want my money being used as strategically and effectively as possible, but this matters to both types of shelters because stray holds are often cited in our ordinances, Remember our public shelters or our public 
the public and animal safety. And there's such a, um, a huge blend now, thankfully, there's so many public private partnerships with shelters that public and private organizations are working under the same umbrella and working so beautifully together. We wanna to see more of that. But we need to make sure that our ordinances and laws are in line with best practices and certainly that there are not barriers to live outcome. I can tell you when I started as public shelter director in my community, no one had looked at the ordinances for three decades. And that is not uncommon. I find a lot of outdated information in ordinances. And we have to remember when we're advocating and talking to our civic leaders, again, we need to think about their microcosm. Their microcosm is public and animal safety with respect to their animal control program. And then because of the position they're in, they need to balance a budget. They're extremely interested in eliminating waste and they need to make sure their constituents are happy. So we need to make sure we're speaking their language. So what does that look like? We know that most people reunite with their shelter dogs within three days and that puppies for the most part are not reunited with their families if they came in as quote unquote strays. So we do recommend a three day stray hold for dogs. We know that there are stray holds in state laws that are higher than that. So unfortunately you can't go lower. You need to change your state laws. Much easier to change your ordinances at the local level. For cats, holy cow no stray hold for cats or kittens, period, end of story. That's because less than 3% are reunified with their families. And we're gonna get into this more, but holding a cat in a shelter does not lead to our intended goal of reunification anywhere, anytime. And I'm going to tell you the right strategy and why that's true. Responsible public policy means I need to have provisions for community cats. That's defined as ferals or friendly. Those are interchangeable. Incentives for a return to owner dog, for example, don't charge them $500 as a fine and not sterilize them or vaccinate them. How about giving them a financial incentive so make it super cheap, $40, and you get your pet, your dog sterilized and vaccinated, and now you're talking about breaking that cycle of intake, right? Um, and of course, eliminating unnecessary barriers. The next level of, that we need to make sure our municipal leaders are paying attention to is what our field offices are doing in the field. And I visited a shelter last year. I analyzed this field statistics and I reported back to leadership and showed them that 70% of the time, their field officers were, were doing things that had nothing to do with animal and public safety. And so don't tell me you need more field officers. You actually don't need as many and they could be doing more productive things to help serve your constituents. And then we wanna talk about our field officers being equipped to not just write citations and, and deal with those um, and enforcement issues, true enforcement issues, but also providing a service to help people in underserved areas. And we know those programs, Santa Cruz County in California is my favorite example. Go on their website and read about them and about turning high intake areas into low intake areas. We don't do that through punitive action. We do it through collaboration. And again, I preach and teach the power of public-private partnerships. Nobody should or could do this alone in the private sector or in the public sector. The magic happens when there truly are effective public-private partnerships. One of the major chasms everywhere in the United States that I see is this giant gap between sheltering and private practice veterinarians. And we are really trying at the national level to bridge that gap. Maddie's is really looking at this. 
open door veterinary care are two is it's a model that's proving that you can have a low cost and financially viable a veterinary hospital and those test hospitals there's one in Asheville there's one in Toledo NOAA's has um, 11 hospitals in the Indianapolis area but they also have a nonprofit program so that anybody that goes into one of their 11 hospitals can capitalize on that nonprofit and they try to help as many people as they can Align Care is something new and emerging out of the University of Texas. This I'm hoping is going to be the major future for how we're going to help pets in need. And it's by interweaving veterinary services into our social services system for people. So people who are on fixed income or the elderly would receive the care they need for their pets as well. So these are just things that are happening and I'm sure you all have other great examples too, but just a major, major opportunity for us to create mutual beneficial partnerships between shelters and private practice veterinarians. Because we um, have been and, and continue to have a very serious shortage with shelter veterinarians, in particular with high volume surgeons. And that's because less than 1% of all veterinarians devote their careers to sheltering. So we need our private practices to be service providers, especially for targeted spay neuter programs. And we know that when we focus on these particular groups, fixed income pet owners, high intake areas, large breed dogs and community cats, holy cow, our shelter intake drastically plummets everywhere, every time when you do it right. Who pays for this? Who does this? This is all products. The most successful are products of those public-private partnerships. Peter Marsh's research suggests that for fixed income pet owners, there's five to 10 of those subsidized surgeries per thousand people in a community. And Jacksonville is just a great graph. We have Waco, Texas actually looks the same, but you can see that first line that goes up from left to right, the green line, that's the number of targeted spay neuters that are increasing in the community at um, the high volume spay neuter clinic. And then there's a direct inverse correlation with intake at the shelters and euthanasia. This is what happens when we do targeted spay-neuter right. Now you might say, well, my community doesn't have a high volume spay-neuter clinic. Well, Huntsville doesn't always have a high volume spay-neuter clinic either. And they've been able, again, with public-private partnerships, SNAP is a nonprofit, the city and the county, all contribute to the surgeries that uh, you can see that line that's sort of horizontal that speak and the reason it's horizontal is that's the surgery capacity per, for the private practice veterinarians so this is why it's so important it can still be done we just need more veterinarians to help especially with those targeted surgeries but here is the visual that I want you to take home, is that we have created this system, traditional system on the left, which is like a funnel. All the animals flood in, no questions asked. We make it super easy, but then we make it really hard for them to get out of the shelter. Maybe that's a cumbersome adoption process. Maybe it's high adoption fees. Maybe it's a long stray hold. Maybe it's dot, dot, dot before you get to adoptions. And what we want to talk about is the right side. What are we doing before the funnel in the community so that we're only using the shelter space for those animals that have no other options? And then we're going to make it super easy to get them out in a really short period of time. And I can promise you, 10 years ago, even 15 years ago, we were not having these conversations and public shelters were saying, this is what we have to do. We have to take every animal in anytime, end of story. Well, 
but thankfully this, this philosophy has changed and it's called managed admissions. And more and more shelters are asking the question, wait a minute, before we take your pet into the shelter, let's talk about what you need and how we can help you either keep your pet or place your pet. And I know I was just like many of you, and I judged those people leaving animals in shelters. I thought they didn't care, they didn't deserve their pets. Give me that pet so I can get them a quote unquote good home. Well, let me tell you, this study the ASPCA did, I think this was, uh, it was 2015, this study found that 80% of the people who were surrendering did not want to they just didn't have access to the temporary resources that they needed. So remember that chasm with private practice veterinarians. What an amazing opportunity we have here to not waste money, bring animals into the shelter and have to worry about fear free. What an opportunity we have to keep them in homes where they're already loved and cared for. Somebody just needed some temporary help but we need to step out of our own microcosm of judgmental and those people don't deserve their pets. So we're talking about people who really love their pets and just need some temporary help. The sheriff in Brevard County, Florida is an elected official. And the first year we worked with him, um, we said, hey, we want you to do this managed admission thing. And he's an elected official. So you know, he's not gonna do anything that his constituents don't love. But we said, we just want you to see how you can help people. And the big part of this story, there's two big stories in one. One is the first year by asking that question, the owner surrender rate decreased by 80% in the owner surrender category. That means that 80% decrease of owner surrenders and guess what? It was budget neutral. So again, we have this scarcity. Oh, we can't do that. We don't have the money. We don't, we can't afford it. We can't add more staff. They didn't add more staff. It was the same intake person. Instead of just letting the animals flooding in, she was the one working with those owners saying, what can we do to help? This is major. And if you leave with nothing else, this is the message that I want you to hear. Another bright spot, Good Samaritans. We've never capitalized on Good Samaritans, bringing us all those puppies and kittens and all of those animals because we have always felt like we were victims of um, well, this is what we have to do and uh, these are people that don't care. So we let these animals flood into the shelter and then we panicked and then we can't find fosters and dot, dot, dot. Well, when Jacksonville went from saving very few animals and transitioned into saving more than much more than 90%, they were at a turning point and out of desperation said to the Good Samaritans, oh my gosh, we don't want to be put in a position to euthanize for space. So can you foster these babies and we'll sterilize them and we'll vaccinate them, but can you just foster them and we'll work with you? And that's how Jacksonville and many other shelters that are doing with this engage their community and went from crickets when they were asking for foster parents to capitalizing one at a time on those good Samaritans turning them into fosters. And Maddie's proved that this is the way to do it because what they found was no shock. When you give people the supplies, the, the sterilization, the vaccines, and you help them foster, that's when the magic happens. So Jacksonville went from the at the city shelter a couple of hundred fosters a year to several thousands, but that is a mature community that has a rock and live outcome program. And so that system is a well-oiled machine. HomeToHome.org, I hope you all know about it or heard about it. It's a pretty new website that was created by Mandy Evans from the Panhandle Humane Society. 
But as they had this very long waiting list for animals to come into the shelter, Mandy thought, we really need to see how we can help people on that waiting list. So Home to Home is a website where you can post that person's pet and information and then link them to potential adopters so the shelter is bypassed. If you want to talk about a fear-free solution and bypassing the shelter, this is it. So look into Home to Home. This is something that Maddie's is supporting and helping shelters around the United States brand to their shelter. So a great example. The next level is, again, part of that funnel and part of that irresponsible public policy that so many county ordinances are still hanging on to with stray holds for cats. But here's the facts about cats. As I said, cats are twice as likely to be euthanized versus dogs in shelters and best friends found that in 2018. So cats are at higher risk. It is extremely common even in shelters who are saving over 90% to have inhumane housing for cats. And we know that stray holds do not lead us to our ultimate goal of reunification. And I, I'm starting this part of the presentation by telling you all, I thought this was the craziest thing I ever heard. This return to field, worst title for any program because we're not returning them to a field. But I thought this program was insane and I didn't agree with it and I didn't know who the cat, who were feeding the cats, but boy, has the data, the trends, the successful programs, and the many, many hundreds of thousands of cats proving this is what we need to be doing. So if you took a break, please pay attention to this part because it is the, the cats entering our shelters is choking our shelters and it's very common to see shelters now over 90% for dogs, but under 50% live outcome for cats. And I promise you, if you embrace this program, that changes immediately. So first of all, when I say community cat, I am talking about friendly or feral. Ferals actually make up a small percentage of the community cats that are outside but they cause the most complaints, so that's where people trigger. And I want you to try not to trigger to colonies because what I'm talking about is colony prevention. So let's just start with the facts. There is no such thing as a stray cat. All you cat people know, cats are smarter than people and they know exactly where their food source is. They know exactly where their home is. They know exactly where their hiding spots are. And how about this? It's estimated that about half of Americans allow their cats outside. So my question is, why have we trained the public to take a cat they see outside to a shelter? It makes no sense at all now that we have the data that less than two, 3% are reunited with their owners. And if you say, well, listen, we live in Massachusetts or Portland and we don't euthanize cats for space. So that cat, you know, was outside. So we're going to take them into the shelter and find him a home. So the question is, he already had a home or multiple homes, most likely. And in fact, three people think it's their cat. Why would you use your precious finite resources, space, money, volunteers, staff, for a cat that didn't need your help? They didn't need another home. They already were cared for. Look at the cat. The cat is 10, 12 pounds, healthy body weight, healthy coat. The cat is eating and not starving. So what the research shows, guess what? Less than 1% are too sick, ill, or injured to actually be part of this program that I'm talking about. So you should consider the return to fields program, the return to owner for, for cats. And here's why the health departments should take notice. We know that the CDC is reporting the incidence of rabies in cats in the United States is decreasing. And 
right now when we do nothing and all these cats are reproducing exponentially, nobody's vaccinated against rabies. When we return a cat sterilized to their original location, we by definition increase community immunity against rabies. We prevented that colony from getting bigger or we stopped a colony altogether. This means there are less cats, especially interacting negatively with people, and less cats negatively in, um, influencing or impacting wildlife. And here's the crazy thing. I thought I couldn't do this in my community because everybody would complain. And this is the common knee-jerk response with civic leaders. Oh, we can't do that. Everybody's going to complain. And the crazy thing is, I can promise you in every single community, the enforcement complaints have virtually disappeared and there were sprinkled through the year, people that just needed help resolving what neighbor dispute they had or somebody never had any sterilization access. So yes, there is a problem in that particular neighborhood. We're gonna see how we can help them. So we, do, we need to help people solve their problems, but when we do this program, it's so incredibly effective that enforcement complaints virtually disappear disappear. So amazing in the community. But what happens in the shelter? I never thought I would see in my lifetime. I know I saw a lot of empty cages when I started out 30 years ago, because a lot of animals were euthanized. But now I'm seeing a lot of empty cages, because so many animals were saved. And remember that Waco chart, I'm going to show you some more decrease cat intake. Remember, I'm sterilizing and putting cats back, and if I continue to do that, I'm automatically hitting my high intake areas, and therefore, my cat intake is decreasing because those were the cats that were supplying my shelter. In the shelter now, I have less cats, I have less competition. So now, that 20-year-old cat that cat with one eye, the diabetic, the feluc positive, whatever, those cats were the first tier euthanasias. Now they're getting adopted too because there's so the, the competition for cats is so much lower. Resources for dogs, all you dog people should support this community cat program because dogs get more resources. Boom, we euthanize, we end euthanasia as population control. But now we have the opportunity to provide humane housing. I go into shelters, sometimes they have portals in those stainless steel cages, but they're closed because they're too overcrowded. Now I have the opportunity to provide that fear-free and humane housing. And this is again about my resource allocation. So I'm showing the Waco graph just for cats, just so you can see the trend that is everywhere, even with a, even with a poverty rate of 30%. Look at that dramatic decrease. This is what we dream about. Not just year one, not just year two, but every year after our euthanasia continues to go down. Nashville's another great example. The Pet Community Center Spay Neuter Program is amazing, helping decrease that intake and look at that live out outcome going up. That is a dream trend for a community. Here's Greenville, South Carolina. Year one was 2016 and 2,000 less cats went into the shelter and 2,000 less cats were euthanized. Here's the story. It was budget neutral. Are you kidding me? Before we had this data, Everybody was running around saying, oh, we don't have the money, we don't have this, we don't have that. Montgomery County, Ohio, guess what? Their municipal ACOs were paying the shelter $60 to take the cat. Now, instead, they're using that $60 for the spay neuter. So there is money, unless you're not at baseline budget with some few shelters are under baseline budget, but if you're at baseline budget, this is likely something that could be done in your shelter too. But again, look at year two, 
decreased intake and decreased euthanasia continues. Look at that orange kitty in that picture. That's a little kitten that came in the day I visited Greenville County in June of this year. And I took a picture of him because he was the only kitten in adoptions. And that is because that shelter went from crowded, cats crowded into those cages like postage stamps to he is the only kitten in adoption, the only feline in adoption. So I had to put his picture in the presentation. But again, when we use our shelter space strategically for only those pets that have no other options, or I do have a foster home in two days, okay, I'm gonna bring them in. I, this is when we put ourselves in a position and our shelters and our communities in a position to provide a fear-free environment and experience for dogs and cats. And that's because length of stay, going into a shelter is number one scary. Number one is it smells weird. I don't know who these people are. The dogs are barking, they're giving me a headache, the cats smell funny, it's overcrowded. Now the people are stressed, which causes stress for the animals, higher infectious disease, decreased life-saving potential, reactive use and waste of resources, and this is what I'm talking about, about downstream symptomatic issues. These all go away. When we, when we set ourselves up for success. So fear-free is not just a piece of this puzzle. Fear-free is a mandatory, intricate part of what has to be happening. People and pets now are more relaxed. Like those staff that tell us, oh my gosh, we used to come to work just in high alert adrenaline mode, not knowing when the other shoe would drop and, you know, getting ulcers. And now it's a joy to come to work and we're excited um, to be saving so many animals. When we feel better, the animals in our care feel better and we're able to work and operate within our capacity for care. We want everybody to imagine that they were the cat or they were the dog. I remember when I was public shelter director and I said to my staff, did you not see the cat hit the ceiling when you slammed the cage? Did you not see how that dog reacted when we were trying to cut his nails, putting him into an advanced yoga position? You have to feel and understand how they're feeling when they are exposed to this environment that is stressful or how we're handling them one-on-one. -on -one. We have to imagine that we were the cat or the dog. And when we welcome animals in the shelter because they have no other option and we didn't have another alternative, I want shelter dogs and cats to feel like they are checking in to the best hotel, room service, amazing food, and that means BTW, twice a day, canned and dried food for dogs, and we know cats are grazers just like horses. They should have dry food and canned food should be twice a day separate. They should have comfy beds. They should sleep and rest peacefully. They should have spa treatments and baths and have fun and play groups and all of those things. And I ask you, when we are overwhelmed and over capacity and animals are flooding into our shelters, are we able to offer this to animals that are entering our shelters? No. So that's why everything I've talked to so far is so incredibly important. And it is the way that we can make our shelters more like hotels. And it begins then with all those things in the community. And then if they do enter, when those little paws hit the ground at our shelter, what are we doing? We need to start our plan of action at that moment. Of course, they need their preventive care, their vaccinations. They need their pictures posted on intake. They need social media outreach. 
we need to make sure the visiting public sees all the animals in our care. I recently posted um, a beautiful design, and I'm happy to say I was part of it, at the SPCA Cincinnati, where they um, have, they designed the middle of the cat adoption wing with the portalized cages where everybody can interact, and then the ones that are maybe URI or they're nursing moms or neonates, they all have separate HVAC, but the public can see them because again, I want to create a system that defaults to the shortest length of stay and I'm gonna do that by engaging my community from the outset. Now I'm not talking about our enforcement cases, maybe dangerous dogs, zoonotic cases, et cetera, but if those good SAMs can't take them right off the bat, I have my fosters on deck, I have my rescue groups on deck, so that this, this plan of action starts to unfold immediately. So enrichment is non-negotiable. We, um, I think everyone is embracing this now. So we want double compartments for dogs. This is an example in Tracy, California. Beautiful design, designed by UC Davis. Inside outside runs, divider doors, comfy beds. And so we want to make sure that we have the double compartments for our dogs and so that we have the opportunity to sanitize appropriately. And by the way, a note on sanitation too, we want, I personally recommend rescue accelerated hydrogen peroxide and they um because i think they are the best cleaner we also know and and understand why fear free recommends them as well because they're odor neutralizing and those odors are so stressful to animals in shelters whether it's the urine and cortisol etc um, but the sanitation is important and it's important to know how infectious diseases work so we create the most effective sanitizing protocols cage enrichment dogs are bored in shelters usually so we want to make sure they have things to do and that human contact one-on-one -on -one and play groups and all of those things are also provided for them this is another Great example also in Tracy, California. So you can see how the cat cages have the divider door in the middle. You can also do other things like give them a shelf here. Um, but this is gives you the ability to not just be able to spot clean, but to separate the litter boxes and the food and the bed. And that is because cats are fastidiously clean and they don't like to eat where they go to the bathroom no different than you don't want to eat while you're sitting on the toilet and i'm sorry to be so crass but this is how we house cats a lot of times and it's and they don't like it so i'm just telling you because i'm being the cat <laughs> and these are things that i see quite frequently but you can go online and there's so many great enrichment um, examples uc davis also has a great do-it-yourself guide you can go on the correct shelter medicine site i should have put that on this slide board and buster Pro board and buster program is great of course there's companies that have donation programs and there is nothing that can help us provide a fear-free and beautiful and enriched environment more than volunteers because we will probably never have enough staff in our shelters to do that. We have to make sure that we are embracing and loving on and engaging our volunteers and all those people that care about shelter animals or animals in our community. That plan of action, again, starts in the field. So our officers need to be scanning those dogs for a microchip and attempting to reunite those dogs in the field. Remember, return to field for cats is the way to go because people typically don't ever even keep ID on cats, let alone collar or microchip. Um, posting on intake, and I already talked about those alternatives. And then we get to the layer where um, is 
in my mind, that in my opinion, the number one live outcome barrier in shelters today. And that is a very judgmental adoption program. And I will start with this best friend survey Sorry, from, whoops, could you, excuse me. I will start with the best friend study from 2018 that showed that 76% of the people who went to pet stores or breeders, which by the way, I was judging, had already visited an adoption agency, could have been a shelter or a rescue group, and it was too cumbersome, too difficult, too invasive, or like my Cornell Veterinary School classmates, three of them, they were denied adoptions. So please don't tell me there is a shortage of adopters. There is no scarcity of adopters. We need to remember our microcosm because even though we have the best intentions, that fear that we're going to adopt to one of the, the very, very small percent of perpetrators of cruelty, neglect, and abandonment has created this very unwelcoming system for people to come to our adoption agencies to adopt. Please go on animalsheltering.org and read or order. You can download it for free, Adopters Welcome by HSUS. Hands down, the most beautiful guidelines and very humbling to me in 2015, I, I learned a lot from that guideline. And what I learned was some really important data. 144 million family pets. We now know last year, 5.3 million animals went into our shelters, but a very small percentage of those were victims of cruelty, neglect, or abandonment. So again, we have to step out of our microcosm of the small percent and look and see, wait a minute, 144 million family pets live in large, sleeping on pillows and on king size beds. I need to remember my microcosm and I need to trust that I can welcome people to my adoption program not only to make the best match, but I want to build a relationship. Maybe they never sterilized a pet before and they didn't know what that meant, so you denied them. But I submit to you that they want a pet, and if you deny them, they will go somewhere and get a pet, and they will likely not be sterilized. But if I welcome them to my program and I educate them about why they, sterilization is so important, I vaccinate them, I provide a sterilized pet for them, now I started a relationship. I set expectations for what's going to happen when they take them home. I am there for them. Again, when I'm in the weeds, when, I'm, when animals are flooding in my shelter, I don't have time for this fear-free part of sheltering, right? So I want to make sure I'm giving the best possible opportunity to the animals that are getting adopted in my shelter or program. Um, and then I already talked about the fosters. We know there's lots of virtual stuff happening. Maddie's has a pet assistant. Best Friends has a virtual vet assistant. So you can look into those things. We know that showcasing especially those large dogs with the adoption ambassadors and foster programs, nothing better. We need to, A, not take in especially large dogs, but if we do, we better be working extra hard to highlight their most positive parts of their personalities because frustration and, um, and that mental breakdown starts to happen day after day after day. But when we do send our pets into foster and adoption ambassador programs, empowering our volunteers to make those placements so we don't take them back into the shelter. Why would we want to do that? But remember, our volunteers, rescues, and fosters need to have the same open adoption philosophy. We love our rescue groups. We estimate there's 
probably 10,000 rescue groups in the United States, twice as many shelters, and this is such an important lifeline. We want to make sure that there are mutually beneficial and clear guidelines and partnerships with shelters and, and shelters are not, for example, charging rescue groups to transfer animals. This is such an important lifeline. Lastly, I wanted to mention that with our University of Florida program, the Maddie Shelter Medicine program, we select eight to 10 shelters a year. And we're looking at shelters that are euthanizing a lot of cats, but it's to provide a pro bono assessment and it would be for 2020 and that includes dogs. So it's a holistic assessment. So if you're one of those shelters or if you know of a shelter that would like to apply, please contact us. This is an amazing opportunity and we'd be happy to talk to you about it. I wanna thank everyone. Thank you Fear Free so much for putting a name to the most important thing to me for our dogs and cats that enter shelters or our dogs and cats in general. Um, Fear Free Pets to Dr. Marty Becker. I started a Facebook page in April, so I hope you follow Team Shelter USA and the Best Practice Playbook with your Fear Free Tips is now available on Amazon and five lucky winners will be sent a signed copy. So Jessica, I'm gonna open it up to comments or questions and I have no idea how long I spoke for. For all I know, it could be four hours now. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Pisano. You actually hit your hour, so great job. Wow. Um, we had a couple of questions come in through the Q&A, so. Great. I Start with the first one. Um, Georgia requires inspections of all foster homes twice a year, so it pulls a lot of resources to do this and maintain records. What are Florida's rec requirements on foster homes? That's a great question, and I know that about Georgia. There are a couple of Department of Agriculture's at the state level who require that, and in Florida, there is not a requirement to um, do home checks on fosters. Great, thank you. Um, next question. How can we engage municipal leaders to change or care about a community cat ordinance? Also, our municipal shelter supports trap, neuter, release, but fears return to field without an ordinance change will legalize return to field. How can we convince them to return the cats? They don't like the image of their officers being seen returning the cats. Yes, and this is really, really common. And so first of all, I wanna tell you, 100%, I can give you hope and a guarantee that it can work in your community. Because remember, before 2007, this wasn't even a thing. So all the organizations and communities that are doing it now started right where you are. So number one, I want you to, of course, buy the playbook because there's a section on legislation and community cats, and it will outline these um, exact answers. And here's the, here's the key notes. Number one, you want to approach your municipal leaders not about the cats you want to approach them and say did you know that there is a program that's wasting a lot of resources and not actually helping you with your goals so talk about it as a program as something that the shelter is doing or the municipal program is doing and show them how it is not leading to their intended goals, which is, okay, let's just start with constituent services. Well, this person complained and we picked up the cat. So what you can tell them is that solved nothing because guess what? More people are caring for cats outside and there's lots of cats in that guy's neighborhood. And so removing that one cat did absolutely nothing. So you want to approach them again and speak their language. You wanna talk about helping them eliminate waste, establishing responsible public policy, 
Best Friends also has this in their guidelines, in their, in their, man, um, in their manual. It's called um, the Animal Control Manual. You can also look at the ordinance recommendations in there. But again, don't talk, talk about the cats last. When you sterilize the cats, there's less complaints actually. And there's lots of places like Huntsville, Alabama, Boone County, Kentucky, lots of places where the ACOs are returning the cats. But you know what? That's kind of phase five. Like that's okay that, that it might not be their ACOs, just somebody needs to, to return the cats. And maybe it's through a public-private partnership. But I, I encourage you to move forward, talk to communities that are, are, have already gone through this transition. The Million Cat Challenge is a great resource for you. And Cameron Moore with the a Million Cat Challenge now is one of the leading experts. So we'll be happy to talk to your community through that program. Thank you. That is, a, that is the number one question. And it's a lot easier than you think when you approach it in the right way. Awesome. The next question, um, as a dog trainer who sees a lot of fearful dogs, many with aggression issues, I wonder how we can get more shelters slash rescues to understand the importance of behavior modification and better placement for these dogs. That's a great question. And um, I'm asking the same thing. And so that's why I do the work that I do, because I think that everything I talked about benefits dogs. So I speak nationally. I do a lot of webinars. I get questions like that. Well, how can we provide enrichment for large dogs that are going cage crazy? And my response is, I'm not going to talk about that first. I want to know what you're doing first to keep those dogs out of the shelter because oftentimes it's nothing. So number one, are we keeping as many pets in homes and to answer the trainer what i would love to see is more partnerships more vet, more shelters employing trainers or at least having partnerships with trainers and making sure that we are providing guidance and training for those first time dog owners or even dog owners in general um to really make sure we're capitalizing on that bond and they stay in their home then number two, let's talk about if they do enter the shelter, and this is the beauty of Fear Free, now you can have all those, everybody, shelters and rescue people get Fear Free certified so they can recognize the, the very blatant behaviors that are indicative of mental deterioration, spinning, jumping, barking, um, going cage crazy, pogo sticking, being aggressive, all of those things are, uh, yes, the dogs are trying to communicate with us, but they're saying, I need this to change. And so getting those rescues that maybe don't understand it, number one, get them to do the fear-free certification. As everybody knows by now, it's online, it's free. There's going to be lots more webinars and information. And Thank you for that really important question. I think it is, um, it is the, the, for dogs, the number one crucial question. All right, thank you. Um, just a couple more questions we have time for. Um, with the spay and release community cat program, how do you address cold weather areas? Oh, that's a great question. Okay, so first I wanna tell you that we do work in all over the country and we work in northern climates and so sometimes we go to northern climates and they say well we have a, you know we're overrun with cats and all these things but we can't put the cats back because we have a coyote problem or it's cold here well you wouldn't have a you'll be overwhelmed with cats if it was really that bad so remember cats are surviving without us and they're reproducing in the cold weather and in the warm weather so no different than if I'm in Florida and I have a hurricane coming, all right, I'm not gonna release them the day the hurricane is coming. I'm not gonna release them if I know there's gonna be a blizzard or it's gonna be negative 20 degrees. But remember that the cats 
are already surviving and they already know where their hiding places are. And if they're friendly, they already have homes. So there are some, I know Indy, um, Indy Farrell, there's a, if you look up cold weather um, enclosures, there's some, and Alley Cat Alleys, I think, has this on their website as well. You can see how there's some areas that when they released cats, they put a little hut there just, just in case the cats didn't know where to go. But I'm now of the opinion cats know exactly where to go. But remember, they're surviving without us. They're thriving. They're reproducing. All we're saying is we need to sterilize them, but they're doing just fine from where they are. Awesome, thank you. And then the last question, uh, where can these return to field stats be easily found so we can present to our state and county officials? That is a great question. So in the playbook, uh, there's a lot of these examples. As I said, there's charts with legislation. Um, there's a lot of information on Million Cat, and this particular webinar will be archived at, on the Fear Free Jessica. You have to clarify if it's going to be on the website, so you will have access to this. In addition, Cameron Moore did an excellent community cat webinar and if you i'm sorry i don't have it off the top of my head but it's a 10 minute community cat webinar that's quick to the point if you googled university of florida or reached out to cameron at million cat um, we can send you information as well perfect thank you so much dr bizzano thank you virox for sponsoring us and thank you for everyone joining the webinar today We'll be choosing the five winners of the Shelter Playbook this afternoon and contact via the email they provided at registration. You'll be able to find a recording of this webinar on fearfreepets.com within the next week or two. Thanks again and have a great day.